Greetings, my name is Ryan Tibbins, and today I'm gonna to be talking to you a little bit about options that graduating seniors from the class of 2020 may have as we head into the fall. There's been a great deal of uncertainty with school closures, both through the spring, but then obviously some schools have to make serious decisions about what's going to happen in the fall. Will colleges be open, on campus, online, a blend? There's a million options and there's a lot of uncertainty right now. So one of the things we wanna do is talk about some of your options and help you to decide what will be best for you. Now, the, some of the programming directors at the Loudoun County Public Library reached out to me about doing a video like this almost two months ago, and I, I wasn't actually really putting it off. I just kept thinking, you know, what are the options? What are the options? And aside from the things that are obvious, you know, just go to school, roll the dice, you know, or, or um, forfeit your deposit and take a year off, go to a different school. I didn't really know what to tell students. So something that I've done over the last um, couple of months is reach out to people who know a little bit more about this than I do. Uh, on the side, I run ClassCast podcast uh, that streams on all major services. And recently I've talked to people who uh, specialize in gap years. Uh, Julia Rogers, who's the president of the Gap Year Association, which is the national organization in the United States that compiles information about and in certain ways accredits gap year programs. Uh, they also run a national survey to maintain contact with former gap year students and things like that. Um, I also recently spoke with Megan O'Connor, who's the entrepreneur in residence at Kaplan. Kaplan's one of the biggest education companies in the world. And something that she's doing there with Kaplan is they're launching a program called a boost year. Now the boost year is sort of like a gap year, but it's done all online. And the goal is to focus more on um, career readiness and, and helping students to choose a good career path for them. So what I'm gonna do is just sort of break down a few of the options that I have heard of or that I've learned about recently. And just to put it out there, I'm also going to provide some links to some great information, some websites with uh, a lot of other links to gap year programs, to college preparation courses and things like that. And then of course, if you have additional questions after this short video, you can always feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, while I do run a small tutoring business on the side, at quick emails and, and simple advice is, is always free of charge. I'm happy to help. We just wanna make sure that students are making good decisions for themselves, that we are happy with our educational experiences, both in high school and in college, and anything we may do in between. I wanna empower you to do what's right for you. So I'm gonna put up a slide that has a few quick talking points, and I'm gonna share some information with you about each of those. So the first thing that we want to talk about is obviously what might happen in the fall. Now, there are lots of options, okay? We have universities both in the state of Virginia and across the country who have already come out and said, we're going to open in person. We're going to try to have the traditional college experience. And as of right now, that looks like it's an entirely you know, realistic option. However, if you read most of those messages carefully, there's usually a little bit of a a little bit of a, a waiver. There's a back door there where schools are saying, you know, based on the conditions at the time. So while many schools are saying that they do plan to open in person, we do have to be careful because we know that that could change. Uh, one of the first universities that gave a public statement about this at all was Yale. And Yale actually said that they were looking into the situation very carefully and that they were going to try to avoid an online fall semester, primarily because they believe that one of the the, the greatest sort of offerings that Yale has is their physical resources, the libraries, the labs, all of the resources on campus. And so something that they had at least considered initially, and this is we're thinking like late March, early April, is that they were talking about potentially um, just skipping the fall semester altogether. Now, it sounds like that is not going to happen, okay? It, it, now, I don't know if they've made an official statement yet, but Yale, many other schools have, have said basically that they don't have any intentions of skipping the fall semester. And I think that some of that is because they know students want to start school. They don't want to delay people's uh, educational plans or their, their target dates for graduation. I also think that for many schools, realistically, they may not be able to do that financially, right? So most schools are going to be in session. The question is, will you be in person, online, or whatever else? Now, there are some schools, a few schools across the country, a few schools in California, I know for sure I've already said this, that they're going to be online only for the first semester. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Some students do like 
to, to study online. And in some ways that might be a good thing for some people. However, if you have applied to and were admitted to a traditional four-year school and your goal was to be on campus, then it would obviously be a disappointment to not get the fall semester of your freshman year on campus. Um, you know, I say all the time that 50% or more of the most important things you learn in high school, you don't actually learn in the classroom. You learn through extracurriculars, you learn through you know, the cafeteria, the hallways, the bus, those kinds of things. And I think most people would agree that that's probably true in college as well, at least in terms of some of your social growth and personal improvement. A lot of things change for people during their freshman year of college, being away from home for the first time, being surrounded by new people. And for many students, it would be very disappointing to lose that or to maybe only get it for one semester, something like that. So you want to keep up with what your school is going to do. Okay, so you see the first line on this slide it says, follow your institution on Twitter and Facebook. Most schools have been communicating a lot. Um, some schools have actually maybe been over communicating. Uh, McSweeney's is a great online uh, satire website. And a few weeks back, someone actually wrote a, a mock letter from a university to you know their prospective students. And it's hilarious because it uses the same sort of broad generic language that many universities have been using, but it also addressed the idea of overcommunication. And at this point, some schools, uh, while some schools have been a little tight-lipped and haven't said much, there are universities, and some of you have maybe experienced this, that are sending out an email or making a public statement every week or two, even though they don't really have new information. Um, I, you know, I don't know what's the right thing to do there, but I do know that you as the student need to be informed. So follow them on Twitter, follow them on Facebook, check the website once in a while and look for updates, okay? No one is going to be able to say for sure what the fall looks like until closer to the fall. I think we're gonna be at least July and maybe into the first weeks of August before anybody makes final plans. Uh, and I know that's tricky because most schools have move-in dates in August, but I would expect that your, your real plans won't be set until at least July. Now that also creates a little bit of difficulty though, because if you're thinking, uh, you know, they might not, we might be online or maybe we'll be on campus, but there's going to be some changes to the schedule. Uh, I know that Cornell does a very interesting kind of schedule where you take one class at a time for a few weeks and then you go to your next class and your next class. So you sort of put an intensive study in each, in each class or subject area. Um, they're talking about adjusting that schedule so that students can get through their classes but so that fewer students need to be out walking around on campus at the same time. Uh, I've read that some universities are looking at alternative housing plans, that they're gonna try to change the way you live in a dorm and how many people will live in each room or each suite. Um, while there's a lot of interesting ideas, it's hard for me to believe a lot of that because so many schools are already at or over capacity for housing. Uh, we've had several, we've had several schools in state in the last few years who overbooked and over enrolled students and ultimately had to put students in hotels or pay students to take a gap year and start the following year and things like that. So given that so many schools don't have the space, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to sort that out. However, that there is still the possibility that there won't be athletics or that athletic events will be held on campus, but there may not be seating in the stadium. Right. And so if you're planning to attend a larger school or a school that has a strong sports or extracurricular program, you have to consider, do you want to be there in the fall if they're not going to have a football game or if they're going to have a football game that you're not allowed to attend? Or maybe they have the game, but all the pep rallies are gone. Maybe there will be limiting on tailgating and things like that. Now, I'm not suggesting anyone should make their entire college decision based purely on that. But we have to remember that the social aspects of being at a university are, are some, of, it's some of what you're paying for, right? So you want to make sure that you are checking your school's website consistently. You also maybe want to write a quick list and think about what are your priorities? What is it you're really paying for? And at what point do the sacrifices of pandemic adjustments basically put you in a situation where that college doesn't feel like it's worth the money at that point, right? Um, now, unfortunately, some of this is going to need to be done relatively quickly, and I don't want to be sort of the, the bearer of bad news, but many schools uh, are a little tight about deferring enrollment anyway, and many schools that will allow it. I mean, most schools will allow it, but many schools have a deadline of somewhere in early June, which is now, or mid to late June. Okay, so if you're considering the option of taking a year off, deferring your enrollment, and doing something else, and then attending your university next year for the 2021-2022 school year, you probably need to make that decision kind of fast. And that, that is the one thing I regret about making this video so much later than I'd originally intended. Um, I wanted to have better information available, which I've done. 
but it also means you have less time to make your decisions. So hopefully this is something you've already given some, some thought to. Now, one of the things that I want to do here is to work, to take a quick look at what a couple of other schools are saying. So this is straight from the University of Virginia's website, and this is more or less standard. This is their statement on taking a gap year or deferring admission. They say, students admitted to UVA as undergraduates can opt to take a gap year after they complete high school prior to enrolling at the university. Students defer enrollment for many reasons. Some choose to travel, others work uh, or volunteer, and in some cases, deferring might be necessary for health or medical reasons. Each year, 60 to 80 admitted students students to further enrollment until the next. It's going to be more than 80 this year, right? It's going to be a lot more than 80. We don't know how many, but uh, there are going to be a lot of students who are going to choose to defer their enrollment, uh, defer their admission. Maybe it is for a health concern. Maybe it's because they've lost a family member. Maybe it's because someone's lost a job and the financial situation has changed, right? May need to take a year just to figure out, can I still afford this? Now, one of the things you do want to remember is that if you take the year off, if you defer your admission and do not enroll until the following year, you've already paid your deposit and they keep that. And if you ultimately choose not to attend the school the following year, you do not get your deposit back. There are some, I don't think it's many, but I've heard that there are some schools that charge an additional deposit for students who take the gap year just to sort of make sure that you have enough skin in the game um, and that you're not going to, you know, bail on them entirely. Here's the statement from James Madison University, my alma mater. To be approved to take a gap year, the admitted student would need approval from the Dean of Admissions. Students may not enroll full-time at another college or university during their approved period. Jim, you will accept up to eight credits taken for college credit during the gap year. To be considered, JMU requires a detailed explanation of the student's proposed plan for the gap year, as well as acknowledgement of gap year guidelines regarding college coursework. The, uh, the explanation should come in the form of letter addressed to the Dean of Admissions. And then you have the information there. Almost all universities have this information available on their websites. Some of them have actually made it a little more obvious and prominent since we are dealing with all of the pandemic issues and the additional students inquiring uh, about changing their plans and what those options may be. Okay, so if you choose to defer your admission, you need to write a letter um, in, I'll point down here. So uh, in the consider your gap year options, in the second link, which is a link to my podcast webpage, uh, I do include some links that Ms. Rogers provided. So there's also, you can listen to the podcast or clips. Uh, but there's also some links there. One of the clips, she explains the process of requesting um, to defer your admissions. She gives some ideas about what to say and what not to say, including don't say that you're deferring just because of the pandemic or uncertainty. She said to either talk about family finances, to talk about health concerns, or to talk about how you have other opportunities you would like to pursue for this one year. Uh, and I think that's very good advice. In the defer your enrollment section on this slide, uh, where it says check the admissions webpage for details. Well, yeah, you know, we just talked about that. The next link, and there's a bunch of these, uh, and I'm not saying for sure this is the best one, but theartofapplying.com is a decent website with a lot of application and college admissions information. And I went with this link, not necessarily because it's the best, but because it does provide a breakdown of the process of requesting that deferral. It also includes a sample letter. I don't recommend writing something quite that sort of generic, but they do have some information there that can help you out. Um, this is something that should be well-written. It should be purposeful. It should be clear. You should think very carefully about your audience. You're writing to administrators at the university, so you don't want to, you know, talk about how school's not going to be worth it in this format or things like that. You want to talk about what you will gain from the gap year, not so much what you are avoiding by choosing it. Right. So again, take take a listen. If you go to the classcastpodcast.com website, there is a, a link to a clip. You don't have to listen to the whole the whole thing, but there is a clip where Ms. Rogers explains her advice, which is very good. And a lot of it's in keeping with what you might see at theartofapplying.com. You can also just Google search uh, defer admissions, admissions deferral, gap year, or how to take a gap year. There are tons of resources out there, but I've tried to get you a few good things all in one place here. Okay. So if you choose to defer, you, you then have those options. Uh, again, the bottom link there is the a recent episode of the podcast where I spoke to Megan O'Connor, who is working for Kaplan. And, and what we're seeing is that a lot of the bigger um, the bigger education companies are starting to see some value in this gap year or career preparation sort of mode, um, partially because they know so many students are considering deferring their admission. Also, part of it's because these are companies that you know have made their money for decades 
off of test prep and college prep. But with the spring SATs and ACTs being canceled, with the fall dates being a little bit up in the air, right? Um, it, they, they've set the dates, but the, the seating has filled up fast. And there are a lot of public schools who ultimately may not offer, and private schools may not offer the tests uh, just because of their own health restrictions, cleaning requirements, and things like that. So even if you signed up for tests in the fall, and I'm thinking about you know the class of 2021, that's not a sure thing, okay? And so Kaplan is getting into this. Princeton Review has something in the works. I don't know as much about it. Um, but what they're trying to do is create an online gap year program. Okay, gap years traditionally have focused on travel or volunteering, you know, community service, uh, either, you know, domestically or abroad. Because of the pandemic, some travel options will be limited, some work options will be limited. Um, some people take a gap year to work to save money to get experience. But, you know, if we're looking at unemployment that's pushing, you know, 20, 30 percent, 40 percent, you know, who knows where, where that's going to be by the fall. But with unemployment numbers that high and with health restrictions still in place, it may be very difficult for a person with just a high school diploma to get a purposeful and fulfilling internship or work experience. Now, it doesn't mean that there won't be jobs out there, but on average, they may not be the jobs that will help you to better prepare for college or to better prepare for the future. So uh, again, if you're thinking about the gap year, you may need to think about it in new ways. Uh, AmeriCorps is still functioning and does does still have both in-person and online service projects. AmeriCorps, you can just Google that. That is a federal government um, program. It's essentially the domestic version of the Peace Corps. So you can do community outreach, education work, business work, uh, a lot of community improvement, things like that all over the country. They have programs everywhere. And that's a great option that's still hands-on. Um, Otherwise, you know, some, some other programs like Year On is a, is a good gap year program based somewhere in California. They're also preparing an online program to help students. And, and that's essentially what Kaplan is doing, right? They're trying to create an online only uh, fall semester where students will essentially learn about different career paths through case studies and through observing and hearing presentations from people who work at major corporations and in growing industries. It's a cool idea, right? Um, but it is priced comparably to many actual, you know, traditional gap year programs. So it's, you may need to consider the, the cost versus the benefit. I think that the Kaplan's Boost Year program offers a lot of great stuff, a lot of things that, that students should be learning and ideally maybe should be learning in high school. But it's all online, you're working independently. And so, you know, you gotta think, is it worth $5,000 to say, stay home at your parents' house work online to learn these things. Uh, again, I, I think it's a great program, and for some students, it's probably the right decision, but it is also something that doesn't fit the traditional definition of the gap year because it's not fully immersive. It's not experience-based. You're not traveling. You're not doing the work in the community, um, but it would still be very educational, particularly for people who are developing a specific skill set and are looking for different career paths it, through which they might be able to capitalize on those skills. I may not be explaining it perfectly, but you can check out the podcast with Megan O'Connor. Uh, again, it, this is sort of her baby. This is something she's working very hard on and she gives a very good explanation of the program, its benefits and what it may offer. Um, I also do recommend, you know, spending a little time Google searching through other options. As I said, several other large, um, large education companies are, are getting into this space because they're not selling SAT prep, right? They're not selling ACT prep. The, as those tests are going by the wayside and as you know, those tests have become optional for the next year or two at several universities, uh, they're looking for new ways to make money. And so they're expanding into this gap year space. Um, the profit motive isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think we should be aware of it, right? Um, now, the other link, and I've sort of skipped around it here, but it's right in the middle of the page, and this is a link from the John Champ High School website. Uh, John Champ's website has one of the best listings of gap year programs that I've, I've seen, and I've been looking around at this stuff for a while. You can also go to, I believe it's gapyear.org. Um, you can just search for Gap Year Association. They have a huge database and all of the stuff that they include there, they have vetted and they would stand by, you know, as, as the National Association, they believe that that's good stuff. Uh, Champ's website, I'm not sure exactly how that has been um, 
proctored or how that's taken care of exactly, but it's a huge list with a lot of good information that might be worthy of consideration. Okay, so if you're thinking about not enrolling in your school next year and you're looking for an alternate experience, gap year might be the way to go. One other thing to consider is if you believe or know that your college is going to be online, you may consider um, deferring your admissions and taking classes online through community college or through another cheaper resource. Um, now you notice that James Madison University said very directly you can only transfer in, I think it was eight credits or something like that. Um, you know, some schools will have limits. You need to check that. But consider if, even if you don't pay for room and board, if you're paying full tuition to James Madison, to University of Virginia, to William & Mary, to University of Maryland, to anywhere, to any school that may end up going online, and, and all of those are trying to be in person in the fall, but if those schools end up going online and charge full tuition, consider that you could be taking online classes through a community college or a full online school for probably a lot less money and getting similar quality education and experience. So something to consider is if you think that your school is gonna go online and you're not entirely in love with that idea is you, you look at gap year options. If you think your school is gonna go online and you just don't wanna overpay for that, then you may look into other online options where you can start getting your credits and knocking out your gen ed classes. Now again, make sure you check with the admissions office and the registrar at your university because there may be a limit on the number of credits that they accept. Some schools may not accept any at all. Um, and this is why this is all very difficult, right? So I've been thinking for two months about making this video and it was hard because I wanted to give advice, but I realized that everybody's giving the same advice. Wait and see, hope for the best, do your thing. That's not helpful. Um, I also wanna be able to give you something more concrete. So I've done some research, I've pulled some resources, I've talked to experts in the field, and I'm providing you links to hear some of those conversations. Unfortunately, every person's situation is different. Every university is different. So you really need to find out what your school is going to do. You need to consider your personal goals. You need to consider your family's finances. And you, maybe along with your parents or, or some trusted family, friends, advisors, you need to think about what's going to serve you, not just for the next six or 12 months, but think about what will serve you for the rest of your life. College is a major investment of money and of time. And while I certainly recommend it to most people, we have to remember that it's not for everyone and that the in-class, in-person model or the online model or a blended model may not fit your goals or your learning styles. So you need to think very carefully about the experience that you want about what you need to learn and how you think you'll learn it best. And then take a look and take your best guess at what your school's going to do. From that point on, you then have sort of two options. You enroll and cross your fingers and hope everything works out. I think that's what most people are gonna do. Or you do a little research, you write your letter to request the deferral, and hopefully the school grants it. And if they do, you then need to make sure that you find something productive to do in the year. A gap year can be a great opportunity to learn, to grow, to find the things that fulfill you and give your life purpose and meaning. Um, but if you don't have a plan for it, it can end up just being a year of sitting on the couch eating potato chips. And when next fall rolls around and it's time to go back to school, you may find that you haven't learned a lot, you haven't grown a lot, and you may actually be less prepared for entering university than you are now just because if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. That's what I would say. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. And so if you have a year where you are disengaged from school, you don't have a job and you're not trying to do some volunteer work or something like that, then you know that can be a problem. So while I don't know the right answer for every person who will watch this video, I do know that you need to find an answer. Okay, just floating forward is probably not the right thing to do at this point. Um, you know, hopefully your, your educational institutions can take decisive action, but whether they do or not, over the next couple of weeks, most students need to decide what it is they're going to do and then start aligning all of your options and decisions to that. Okay, think about those goals. Again, um, I hope this has been helpful and I apologize if any of it seems a little vague, but these are uncertain times as we all know. And so it's hard to say something concrete, but I've compiled some solid resources for you and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have through email uh, or the other online outlets. So you can contact me, Ryan Tibbins at Mr. Tibbins at yahoo.com. I also am available through Facebook. Uh, it's just at Tibbins EST or on Twitter at Tibbins EST as well. You can also check out classcastpodcast.com and you follow me on Facebook there at classcastpodcast. 
It's also Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter at ClassCastPod. Um, focus on education, educational issues. And we're actually going to have some upcoming episodes that deal not only with um, preparing for this fall in college, we're also going to be doing some episodes to help students better prepare for college admissions the following year. Okay. Um, I hope everyone finds something meaningful to do in the next year. I hope you make a decision that serves you well, and I hope that you stay safe and enjoy your summer break.